Dolphin Societies, Structure and Function, by Bernd Versig and Heidi C. Pearson. Introduction. Delphinids are social creatures, and a lone dolphin is rare. Even when lone saltwater dolphins occur, without the immediate presence of conspecifics, they tend to associate with other cetacean species, or with humans, presumably as an outgrowth of their intrinsic sociality. While this has been understood for quite some time, we do not fully understand dolphins' social nature. This includes all aspects of their lives – resting, traveling, foraging, feeding, and social and sexual behavior – within the prevalent mating system of a dolphin species or community. Comparisons of behaviours and mating systems among species and even communities that live in different ways in similar or different habitats can help shed light on social needs relative to the environment. Dolphins in riverine and near-shore areas tend to occur in small groups of a few to several dozen, while many open ocean groups occur in hundreds to thousands. Norris and Dole, Wells, Irvine and Scott, and Johnson and Norris related group sizes to proximity from shore and depth of water, the latter being probable proxies for habitat structure, with pelagic species forming larger groups. Goans, Versig, and Kazmaski expanded this idea to build a framework of societal structure that takes into account what the habitat supplies in the form of food, exposure to or shelter from predators, and resources for the care and teaching of vulnerable young. The habitat also affects opportunities for and manner of communication, sociality, and cognitive abilities. In the simplest sense, and here we follow the definition of Norris and Dole, a school, or group, also termed pod, of dolphins comprises those that regularly swim together. This definition ignores the possibility that dolphins some distance apart may be in acoustic contact with one another for as much as hundreds of metres. Nevertheless, we accept this general definition by proximity, as dolphins interacting at some greater distance by sound cannot be associating in important other ways. That is, only while in proximity can they communicate by subtle signals of body motions, exercise caregiving by mother of young, cooperatively surround or herd their prey, or engage in precopulatory behavior or sex. Beyond assessing how many animals are in a group, researchers must also determine who is staying with whom and for how long, what kinds of interactions they have while together, and what kinds of specialized subgroups such as mating units and mother care units might exist. For this, it is important to recognize individuals, generally by photo identification. For example, photos or videos of the nicks and notches on the trailing edge of dorsal fins are now used to identify individuals of almost all delphinid species. And saddle patch patterns and other marks are often used for killer whales, Orsinus orca, uh, as are the spot patterns that identify individuals and age classes of spotted dolphins. Beyond recognizing who is associating with whom, descriptions of behavior are also needed. While most of these have traditionally been made above water, the best cases have come from below water, a situation that necessitates, unfortunately rare, water clarity. Group sizes and social structures in different habitats. In an extraordinary book chapter published over 30 years ago, Wells, Irvine, and Scott laid out a blueprint for linking society structure with habitat, Many more data on society structure, social behaviours, and habitats have been gathered since then. The basic blueprint they developed not only survives, but has been reinforced by this new information. We will integrate some of Wells et al. here, along with early thoughts by Norris and Dole, to generate our own syntheses. In the open ocean, the often large schools of small-bodied dolphins 
such as of the genera Delphinus, Lagenda Delphus, and Stenella, may travel with only one wall, the surface, for life-giving air. As they move in pelagic waters, i.e. deep and offshore, at times too deep even to sense the bottom by echolocation, they may never come in contact with islands or continents. Their entire lives are spent within the school and envelope, and as we delve into subschool structure, we realize that there are sex and age mixed units, nursery units, mating units, and perhaps sub adult units as well. While the large school is the overall stable unit, there is much fission fusion and individual exchange among subunits, so that one nursery unit may not be comprised of exactly the same mothers and calves from one day to the next, or even from hour to hour. It makes sense that these rather small-bodied delphinids gather in large schools for overall enhancement of sensory awareness, faster response time to large predators such as sharks and killer whales, perhaps a confusion effect when attacked, and shared vigilance such as being able to rest while others are awake and wary. Partridge, 1982, provides an early primer on grouping for defense, but only for schools of fish. See also Norris and Schilt, 1988. Delphinid schools in the open ocean can form such large groups only if they have exceptionally large prey reserves available. Most of them move over large distances and feed on deep scattering layer DSL organisms that come closer to the surface at night. Moving over large distances may function to allow prey in a given area to replenish, and may also dissuade predators from waiting in a particular area for the dolphins. When multiple species with similar swimming capabilities coexist in the pelagic zone, they can potentially enhance group benefits such as vigilance against predators by forming mixed species groups. Such groups have been well, de well described, for example in pantropical spotted and spinner dolphins with other tropical species at times mixed in. We surmise that their somewhat different sensory capabilities and activity patterns, such as feeding and resting at different times or feeding on slightly different mesopelagic prey, allow animals in mixed schools to enhance their own capabilities of vigilance, predator detection, and perhaps even food acquisition. Their co-occurrence may be a form of mutualism. While some researchers may argue that such mutualism in large brain salt large-brained social dolphins has led to reciprocal altruism. It is also possible that the mixed school may simply serve to keep each individual safer from predation from large sharks, owing to the dilution effect of larger numbers. Like schools of fish, dolphins pay attention to each other while they coordinate travel and other movements, such as foraging or predator evasion. However, unlike most fish, dolphins must also sort out their partnerships and perhaps subtle dominant subservience relationships, take care of their young, and presumably engage in learning from each other, and possibly even in teaching. In some respects, dolphin schools can be compared to herds of terrestrial grazers, such as ungulates, that are constantly on the move, probably for re reasons such as those discussed earlier of food regeneration and out-traveling their more stationary predators. Dolphins and ungulates have other social communication needs, as they pay attention to each other and make overall decisions of where to go. However, terrestrial ungulates may not have, as far as we know, the capabilities for sophisticated long-term memories, and for the individual and culturally mediated learning that we are just beginning to understand in dolphins. In the open ocean, and with the necessity of sharing prey resources, there is no economic defensibility of resources such as space or food since such resource defensibility is generally considered necessary for the development of monogamy, we would not expect to find monogamous mating systems in these animals. Similarly, polygyny, the common mammalian system of one mate attempting to father multiple offspring on multiple females, is also uncommon in open ocean dolphins, and in most other delphinids, with notable exceptions to be mentioned later. 
Instead, most pelagic dolphins exhibit polygynandry, or multimate breeding, during the same estrous cycle. That is, males show polygynous mating attempts, while females show polyandrous ones, possibly with female choice at both behavioural and physiological cryptic choice levels. Most offshore delphinids tend to be remarkably monomorphic, with only subtle differences in body morphology beyond the genital slit differences to discern them as males and females, although we assume that they can tell each other's sex much better than we can. While such monomorphism is common in monogamy, it is also consistent with polygynandry. Polygynandry. There are likely to be exceptions to polygynandry among a few pelagic small-bodied dolphins, such as the eastern spinner dolphin. Males in this subspecies have a huge post-anal keel and strongly backward-canted dorsal fin, and it is assumed that polygyny, polygyny is the norm in this open ocean society. However, whether mating is mediated by male dominance relationships, female choice, or both, is yet unknown for this subspecies. But what about the larger-bodied delphinids that also occur in the pelagic zone, such as killer, false killer, and pilot whales, or the Rissos dolphins? They occur in the open ocean in quite variably sized groups, from just a few members to several hundred. We assume that they are large and fierce enough, especially the killer whale, to be relatively free from predation, and therefore do not have the same needs for a large school for safety against predators. Instead, school size is probably largely determined by the most efficient size for taking prey, and may vary according to mating strategy as well. Thus, killer whales, for example, aggregate together in superpods, lasting only hours to days, apparently for assortative mating among members of different pods. Pilot whale areas of high potential killer whale pro pilot whale schools are extremely variable in size, and especially large schools appear to occur in areas of high potential killer whale predation on their young, as in the northern parts of the North Atlantic. In contrast, pilot whale schools are much smaller in areas with few killer whales, such as the Gulf of Mexico or the tropics. In either case, these larger-bodied animals tend to occur in mixed-age and mixed-sex groupings, even when in smaller groups. In this way, within both the small and the large schools, all potential functions of communication, courtship, mating, rearing of young, and long-term learning are possible. Killer whales and pilot whales, and possibly Risso's dolphins, tend towards social matriarchies. For, that is, mothers and, mothers and partial sisters, from one mother but usually from different fathers, tend to stay together, so that there are close female bonds within at least a subunit of the larger school. All three species are sexually dimorphic, with the extreme in the large male killer whale with its high and erect dorsal fin. While some element of po while some element of polygyandry polyg polygynandry polyg while some elements of polygyandry may certainly exist in matriarchies, it is likely that these systems tend more towards polygyny with one male attaining more than one paternity during a given period of estrus. In such situations, female choice is probably extremely important, but it has not been thoroughly investigated. Pilot whale and killer whale females also show reproductive senescence, menopause, with at least pilot whales continuing to nurse for some time after senescence, a trait perhaps related to matriarchy. Reproductive senescence appears to be valuable in allowing mothers and grandmothers to continue to be productive in helping and teaching members of the society without the direct cost of pregnancy, and continued nursing may help foster generational bonds, one important component of culture. Before addressing nearshore dolphins, it is instructive to consider delphinids that switch between pelagi pelagic and nearshore zones on a daily and seasonal basis. If we can discern general, and perhaps more specific changes in group size and structure per habitat use, 
we can more closely align the reasons for their school structure with habitat, and behaviour in that habitat. Two good examples are island and atoll living spinner dolphins, that change environments on a deal basis, and dusky dolphins, that do so on both deal and seasonal bases. We will first take each species separately, and then compare them. As noted earlier, spinner dolphins in the open ocean live in large societies, so at times even as a multi-species group, but spinner dolphins, we will call them spinners, show variable uses of habitats, with some staying close to shore and others exhibiting a semi-pelagic lifestyle, switching between nearshore shallow and deep water pelagic zones on a deal basis. We know, this we know this especially well for the Kona Coast, Hawaii, where spinners rest close to shore during the day in small schools of approximately 20 to 100 or more individuals. The predominant daytime activity of these animals is resting in bays over, sh over sandy bottom, being careful to avoid rocky outcroppings or coral where they might be surprised by a shark from below. In the late afternoon, spinners become more active, begin a zigzag pattern of more rapid swimming, and vocalise more as they become more alert and social. After leaving the protected bays, they move alongshore to pick up pod members in ne other nearshore areas, leading school sizes to swell to hundreds of animals. Upper limit is unknown, but estimated from at least 200 to 400 at any one time. This is all in preparation for offshore travel to meet the DSL, where they forage, often cooperatively, on mesopelagic squid and lantern fishes. As described for other species earlier, the large groups no doubt offer the dolphins protection in these deeper, shark-dangerous waters. Sound recordings at night also indicate that spinners are highly vocal during this period, apparently doing much socialising at night. Thus, the large nighttime schools may also be important for mating activities. After the DSL has descended again in the early morning, the large spinner school splits up, and smaller schools fit into the bays. Fit into appears to be an accurate term, as larger bays will tend to have larger schools than smaller ones. Thus, spinners exhibit a deal fission-fusion society. While there remains long-term associations between mothers and calves, as well as some friendship bonds that involve older individuals that stay together for days to years, the composition of a school in Kialukeka Bay, Hawaii, still varies from day to day. The lability of inter-animal affiliation in this fission-fusion society suggests to us that many of the dolphins of the greater nighttime feeding society may know each other reasonably well, and differences in affiliations are useful in maintaining and enhancing bonds. Such bonds may be particularly useful for dolphins that need to communicate efficiently during nighttime, not only to detect and avoid predators, but perhaps also to coordinate cooperative feeding and to form sexual partnerships. In contrast to the Kona coast, this deal pattern of group fission and fusion is not present for spinner dolphins that occur around lone atolls, such as Midway Island, Hawaii, where other atolls are at great distances away. Instead, a particular group of animals will use the same atoll for daytime rest, day after day, implying that the same animals travel together to open waters to feed at night. Presumably, this closed society arose because other atolls are simply too far away for the efficient transfer of individuals. Additional research is needed to determine how this absence of deal fission fusion affects other aspects of social organization and communication in these groups. Kazmowski et al. described an incidence of macro fission fusion in these animals when a subset of dolphins from one atoll moved to another atoll. At first, individuals in this subset rested in the new atoll separately from the original group, but eventually they became physically, and apparently socially, integrated with the resident group. Such emigration from one atoll to another, with dolphins already present, may represent occasional accidental wanderings, but it may also result from societal exclusion from one area, or the need to find new mating partners. 
Indeed, if a resident group of about 100 dolphins at one atoll stayed sexually closed for several generations, unacceptable levels of inbreeding would occur. As it is, atoll genetic diversity is known to be low, and comparisons of gene flow among these atolls indicates that inter-atoll matings take place, presumably as a result of these occasional and sporadic macro-fission fusion events. Dusky dolphins are another semi-pelagic species, but unlike spinners, they seldom occur in pelagic waters. However, duskies occur both over extensive coastal shallows, where the continental slope can be as far as 200 kilometers away, and near coasts with precipitous drop-offs into oceanic waters. In the former habitat type, off southern Argentina and in the Marlborough Sounds, New Zealand, duskies feed on schooling fishes in the daytime and rest in shallow nearshore waters at night. In Golfo San Jose, Argentina, Duskies form a strong fission-fusion society, separating into small subunits of only about 10 dolphins while resting in shallows at night. Arguably, this is a strategy against shark and killer whale predation, since the subunits are less conspicuous than the larger school, i.e. reduced encounter effect. We do, not know, we do not know how duskies react to shark predation, but when killer whales approach, duskies close enough to shore for evasive action attempt to hide in the surf zone. During the morning, groups coalesce during foraging on southern anchovy, and it appears that large groups of up to 300 or so individuals are more efficient than smaller ones at herding fish into tight bait balls at the surface. After feeding, duskies engage in high levels of social and sexual activities in the large coalesced school before splitting into small subgroups for the night once again. Other than mother-calf pairs, the subunit composition is unlikely to be the same night after night. In short, the fusion-fusion events for both duskies off Argentina and spinners off the Kona coast are related to feeding, but with day and nighttime resting and feeding reversed between the two species. Duskies that live near shore, but near the precipitous drop-off at the edge of the Kaikoura Canyon on the South Island, New Zealand, exhibit very different grouping and foraging patterns. Off Kaikoura, they rest and socialize in open water shallows throughout the day, generally staying within the large school envelope of approximately 50 to 1,000 individuals. At night, they move only one to several kilometers away to feed in the deep Kaikoura Canyon on DSL fishes and squid, just as do spinners. Our observations from active acoustic surveys that detect both the DSL and dolphins down to a depth of about 150 meters suggest that foraging occurs individually, with the possibility of some coordinated subgroups of two to five individuals. Instead of going into deep rest for most of the day, as spinners do, duskies alternate rest and social activities in daytime. Within the large school, varying levels of alertness may, may be present at any one time, yielding a collectively useful sensory awareness by the entire group for vigilance against predation. All activities, rest, socializing, mating, and nursing, occur during an overall slow level of traveling, and occur with the large school envelope. However, intensively mating units and nursery groups often segregate off the large school. Nursery groups in particular move into very shallow water close to shore, presumably to minimize predation risk but also likely to avoid the boisterous sociosexual activities and the constant traveling that occur in the main school. Although further research is needed on the nighttime activities of nursery groups, evidence indicates that they do not always join the main group to feed in deeper waters at night, and may instead feed in the shallows during the day. Thus, we can observe deal variations in behavior and habitat use patterns both on the extensive shelf of Argentina and in the nearshore deep waters of New Zealand. New Zealand is unique, however, as there is also a marked seasonal difference for a subset of the overall population. In winter and early spring, about May to October, 
several hundred or more duskies of the general Kaikoura area travel approximately 275 kilometers north to Admiralty Bay, a shallow, under 105 meters bay in the Marlborough Sounds. Here, they radically change their feeding habits and exhibit behaviors similar to those of the Argentina duskies. In the Marlborough Sounds, duskies corral bait balls of schooling fishes into tight schools at the surface. This, co- this cooperative herding behavior is generally carried out in small schools of 10 to several dozen individuals. Although group size is quite liable in the Admiralty Bay, group sizes are smaller overall, averaging seven individuals, and there is not the marked fission fusion of the society seen off Argentina. Potential explanations for these differences are the low predation risk in Admiralty Bay and the fact that not as many duskies can fit into this small bay as in the larger bay off Argentina. Reduced prey availability compared to Argentina is another potential reason for the more muted fission-fusion grouping patterns of Admiralty Bay. Some of the same duskies annually make the summer-winter trek between the deep waters off Kaikoura and the shallow waters of Admiralty Bay. This behavior, only by a subset of the population, hints at the possibility of cultural differences between those that feed year-round off Kaikoura and those that change foraging strategies and habitat according to season. Many populations of dolphins, including common and Indo-Pacific bottlenose, humpback, Irrawaddy River, Australian snubfin, Costero, and three of the four Sephirorhynchus species spend their entire lives in shallow coastal waters. However, a few populations, including common bottlenose dolphins, can be found in shelf and deep ocean waters as well. While not all of these species have been studied intensively, most occur in small groups, generally no more than one dozen at one time, and exhibit both lone and cooperative foraging techniques. Much of what we know about the bottlenose dolphin, soci- most of what we know about bottlenose dolphin societies comes from long-term studies of Sarasota, Florida, and in Shark Bay, Australia. In these relatively shallow, in these relatively shallow, under 15 meter, nearshore habitats, decades of behavioral observation and photo identification have provided tremendous insight into not only grouping patterns but also the nature of social bonds. Both species of bottlenose dolphin that have been studied intensively live in highly dynamic fission-fusion societies, where group structure, i.e. both size and composition, may change on timescales of hours to minutes. Groups typically contain between five and seven individuals, although nursery groups tend to be larger for increased predator protection. Upon closer examination of the social bonds formed within these groups, some striking differences are apparent between the sexes. Bonds between males tend to be stronger than bonds between females, likely due to the cooperative alliance relationships formed between males to gain access to estrous females. In contrast, females tend to form weaker bonds with one another, but have wider social networks, as their social bonds change according to reproductive status i.e. mother-slash-non-mother, cycling-slash-non-cycling, as summarized in Pearson 2011. Except when cycling, females rarely associate with males, likely to avoid male harassment and sexual coercion. In general, when feeding on non-schooling fish, individual foraging strategies prevail, while cooperative strategies prevail when feeding on schooling fish, For example, cooperative foraging on schooling fish has been observed for bottlenose dolphins in the Black Sea, Argentina, South Africa, the Gulf of Mexico, and the Florida Keys. Bottlenose dolphins are even known to cooperatively forage with humans. In Laguna, Brazil, dolphins have been observed driving schools of mullet into fishermen's nets and then capturing fish for themselves as some escape from the nets. Interactions of habitat, foraging types, social behaviors, and society structure. As described in the previous section, foraging strategies vary according to prey type and availability, which in turn vary by habitat. 
These differences in foraging strategies may then parallel differences in social behaviours and social structures. Killer whales are the most cosmopolitan delphinid, and several distinct ecotypes, i.e. populations that have overlapping ranges but are socially and reproductively isolated and also exhibit differences in body size and co coloration, have been identified. Much of what we know about killer whale foraging and social structure comes from studies of the Northeast Pacific, where resident, transient, and offshore ecotypes exist. At the broadest level, these three ecotypes are differentiated by their foraging strategies, as residents and offshores feed on fish while transients feed on marine mammals. Resident killer whales are the only known mammals in which neither sex emigrates from the natal pod. The social structure of transients is less well known, but pod membership appears to be more fluid than in residents, with both sexes dispersing from the natal pod in response to mating and hunting opportunities. Pod size in transients, 1 to 4, is smaller than in residents, 3 to 59, due to transients' reliance on more patchily distributed large prey items that require stealth to hunt and result in food sharing. In contrast, residents benefit by foraging in larger groups and sharing echolocation information when searching for smaller prey items such as salmon. The optimal strategy for transients, then, is for one or both sexes to disperse from the natal pod. Typically, all but firstborn transient males disperse, although a female may return to her natal pod later in life if she is unable to reproduce. Little is known about offshore social structure, making this a rich area for future research. Culture offers one parsimonious explanation for why these stark differences among killer whale ecotypes may occur. Killer whale societies are aptly described as multi-level and multicultural, as cultural variation is present between most societal levels. Resident killer whales, for example, form stable matrilines containing an older female and up to three generations of offspring. Closely related matrilines form pods, each with a unique vocal dialect, or set of calls. Pods that share portions of their vocal dialect then form vocal clans. It is likely that these distinct calls enable individuals to identify their close relatives, thereby avoiding inbreeding, so that mating then occurs between vocal clans at the community level. Genetic factors may also be involved in ecotype differences, since members of different ecotypes do not interact or mate. This leads to reproductive isolation, genetic differentiation, and the persistence of the mammal-eating versus fish-eating strategies that distinguish transient from resident ecotypes. Simply put, it is likely that, at some point in their evolutionary history, some killer whales in the Northeast Pacific began to specialize on fish, and others began to specialize on marine mammals. These foraging specializations likely persisted as they were shared among familial lines, within and between generations, eventually leading to the ecotypes we see today. In fact, emerging genetic evidence indicates that residents and transients, and some of the Southern Ocean ecotypes, may indeed be separate species. Delphinids have slow life histories, characterized by long lifespans and prolonged periods of gestation, infant depend dependency, and juvenility. A slow life history provides time for an individual to develop their cognitive adaptations to respond to sociological demands. As has been documented for other animals with slow life histories, e.g. primates and elephants, a prolonged period of infant dependency in delphinids provides extra time for learning, especially between mother and offspring, but also between conspecifics. Bottlenose dolphins and killer whales offer two excellent examples of the importance of calf learning in the development of foraging strategies. It is also likely that older females, even when themselves no longer reproductive, help serve to teach and care for younger animals, and thus provide a long-term reservoir of wisdom, having lived a long life of social learning. Bottlenose dolphins in Shark Bay are dependent on their mothers for an average of four years, 
providing a long period of time for learning foraging and social strategies. Some individuals, about 5% in this population, specialize in sponging, or carrying a sponge on the rostrum for protection while probing in the substrate during benthic foraging. This foraging strategy allows individuals to exploit lipid-rich fish that lack swim bladders, e.g. barred sand perch, and would otherwise be undetectable via echolocation. Since this tool-using behavior was first observed in 1984, studies have revealed that the majority of individuals that carry sponges are females. Only a small subset of females sponge, and calves learn this behavior from their mothers during their second or third year of life. This is a vertically transmitted cultural behavior, as individuals, mostly daughters, will only sponge if their mother also sponged. Sponging females spend more time alone or only with their calf than do other females, likely due to the increased amount of time required to perform this foraging technique. The relatively asocial nature of sponging dolphins is related to the sex bias in this behavior, which can be explained by intersexual differences in reproductive success. In societies such as these, where males do not provide paternal care, female reproductive success depends largely on gaining access to food and avoiding predation, whereas male reproductive success depends largely on gaining and maintaining access to estrous females. Therefore, while it is beneficial for female bottlenose dolphins to invest time in sponging at the possible expense of social partners, this behavior is not advantageous for males, as their reproductive success is increased through integration into the social network and the formation of mating alliances. Ultimately, these intersexual differences in reproductive success affect social structure, as male bottlenose dolphins are typically more gregarious than females. In short, the extended period of bottlenose dolphin calf dependency provides time for females to learn specialized foraging techniques and males' time to learn about future alliance partners. Similar intersexual differences in gregariousness and the development of tool-based foraging strategies are seen in chimpanzees, where mothers that spend more time termite fishing spend more time alone, and female offspring spend more time termite fishing than do male offspring. Delphinid calves may also be taught foraging skills. Briefly, teaching is a, a behavior performed at a cost by an actor, which only occurs in the presence of a naive observer and results in acquisition of a skill or knowledge by that observer. This is difficult to quantify in the wild, but multiple studies suggest that teaching may occur in cetaceans. For example, in Patagonia and in the Crozet Archipelago, Killer whales intentionally strand themselves to capture pinniped pups and southern elephant seals. Adults beach themselves in the presence of juveniles, but will then incur an energetic cost by either not attempting to capture the pup, or capturing a pup but then relinquishing it to a juvenile. In turn, juveniles benefit by copying the adult's stranding behavior or receiving the prey item. Calves practice this risky foraging strategy for several years before becoming proficient. The prolonged period of calf dependency, high maternal investment, and stable social structures in killer whales facilitate the development of this hunting strategy. Furthermore, the presence of several related adults in one pod indicates that this may be a kin-selected behavior that facilitates alloparental teaching. Understanding Dolphin Society Structure and Function to Inform Conservation Actions Most dolphin societies are characterized by fission-fusion dynamics, where group size and composition fluctuate according to the shifting balance of costs and benefits associated with prey availability, mating opportunities, and predation risk. Grouping patterns that thus reflect strategies to optimize survival and should be considered conservation actions. The New Zealand dusky dolphin population provides a case study for how knowledge of grouping and social behavior has been applied in conservation and management strategies. In Kaikoura, dusty dolphin ecotourism operations have existed since the late 1980s. 
Studies during the same period have revealed that Duskies occur in large, generally fast-moving mixed-sex groups, in addition to satellite mating groups and nursery groups, all of which have lower levels of activity at midday. As tour vessels focus on large groups and adhere to a mandated midday rest period, this is generally considered to be a sustainable industry with no significant long-term effects detected. Additional studies of this population in the wintertime foraging habitat of Admiralty Bay have revealed that cooperative foraging strategies are hindered by mussel farms. These findings were presented to the New Zealand Environmental Court and to date have been successful in halting or at least delaying the expansion of mussel farms in Admiralty Bay. Data show a decline in the dolphins' use of Admiralty Bay in recent years, perhaps due to decreased prey availability, bottom-up effects from mussel farms, and or climate change effects. Continued monitoring of this system is necessary to determine the cause for this shift in use of this seasonal habitat, and a continuing dialogue between researchers and managers is necessary for determining sustainable or multiple uses of this habitat. Avenues for Comparative Research Dolphins, like all cetaceans, have a unique evolutionary history, as they have been separated from their closest terrestrial relatives, the ungulates, for over 50 million years. The comparative approach may therefore be used to understand convergent versus divergent influences on behaviour. Shared ancestry may help to explain some similarities between dolphins and ungulates, such as the production of few to single offspring, at times prolonged periods of offspring dependency, offspring following behavior, and large group formation for protection against predators. However, dolphins also exhibit convergence with less closely related taxa, such as social carnivores, elephants, and primates. Commonalities that dolphins share with the latter taxa include a large relative brain size with complex cognition and sophisticated social strategies. In particular, dolphins and great apes exhibit convergent cognitive abilities, social structures, and behaviors. These taxa are, evolutionary, are evolutionarily separated by 95 million years, and thus offer a powerful approach for testing hypotheses of cognitive and social evolution while minimizing phylogenetic complication. One such hypothesis is the social brain hypothesis, which posits that large relative brain size, specifically a large relative neocortex size, and complex cognition evolved to solve problems associated with monitoring changing group properties, social hierarchies, and networks of relationships. According to this hypothesis, relative neocortex size should increase with group size. While this is supported by data for anthropoid primates and odontocentesis, we need more data on the nature and kind of relationships beyond group size. We emphasize that dolphins are not aquatic apes. And while there has been much convergent evolution, especially of social capabilities, there are also many differences, such as in morphology, physiological capabilities and constraint, and generally extreme habitat differences. Present and future research directions. Much of the behavioral field research on delphinids has been by bread and butter basic observation, this includes work from shore, often with the help of theodolite tracking, from small vessels using focal follows, and from underwater with ever more sophisticated sound acquisition and video techniques. Some limited work has also been carried out with conventional radio tracking, satellite tracking, and data tags, especially on larger delphinids such as pilot whales. Ever smaller, more streamlined, and well-designed tags are now making mu such remote sensing even more tractable, with minimal disturbance to the tagged animals. While it is not possible to predict the development of all the new sophisticated research techniques for behavioral studies, we are particularly excited by developments in the underwater localization of dolphin vocalizations and the rapid development of aerial observation techniques by unmanned vehicles, such as minicopters equipped with video and still cameras. We envision that very soon we will be able to have a small vessel slowly moving with a social group of dolphins, describing focal animal and focal group behavior 
including the use of recognition photography, while an underwater video camera slaved to a directionalizing set of hydrophones gathers into individual behaviors and individually discriminated sounds, and a minicopter eye in the sky gathers better into individual distance and interactional data. A theodolite operator based on shore could also describe the speed of the group, its orientations and reorientations, measurements of meandering, and other group movement behaviors. These devices have all now been individually tested, but we believe it is the combination of old and new techniques, preferably with as little sound and vessel movement intrusion on the life of the animals as possible, that will help us unravel ever more sophisticated aspects of the social behavior of dolphins.